We spent four months on an epic road trip through Arizona. We stood next to towering rock monuments. We toured slot canyons. We hiked to peaks and waterfalls, some that we probably shouldn't have. And we were left speechless by Arizona's beauty time and time again. Yes, Arizona has deserts and cacti, but it has so much more. After spending one month in Taos, New Mexico, we headed to our 10th state, Arizona. Our first stop in Arizona was Holbrook. Long ago, Holbrook was a major stop along Route 66, and remnants of the Mother Road can still be seen throughout the town, including towering steel dinosaurs and the Wigwam Hotel. But we wouldn't be staying in any wigwams. We were visiting Holbrook to do some hiking at Petrified Forest National Park. The Petrified Forest is a uniquely beautiful park. The park's most well-known attraction is the Painted Desert. Scenic overlooks allow you to enjoy the Painted Desert from above, and some of the trails will take you down into the Painted Desert for a closer look. On top of that, each trail has beautiful, petrified woods scattered alongside it, testifying to the former glory of these once great forests. Each trail in the park offered something unique, including the park's most popular trail, Blue Mesa. This trail descends down into the Painted Desert, winding through blue and purple banded badlands, and creating beautiful colors during sunset. Blue Mesa's landscape and vibrant colors were mesmerizing, but our favorite trail was the Devil's Playground. Before we get to the Devil's Playground, this is a quick reminder that Arizona travel guides are now available at SojournExpedition.com. These travel guides are thorough, with detailed photos and explanations to help you plan an epic Arizona adventure. Check out all of our Arizona guides and much more at SojournExpedition.com. The Devil's Playground is difficult to access for two reasons. First, the park only allows for three permits a week, so permits are hard to get. For more information about the permit process and the rest of our trip to the Petrified Forest, check out our Petrified Forest travel guide. Second, access to the trailhead goes through private property on an ungraded dirt road. <laughs> this is exciting. I can't believe we've made it this far. The park recommends high clearance and four-wheel drive. We had neither. This is not going to be good getting out. Oh my gosh. Look at it. It's terrible. When you get your permit, the park makes it very clear that they won't help you get out if your vehicle gets stuck in the mud. I think we made it through the worst part. We made it to the trailhead. The road was definitely a little sketchy. We weren't really sure if we were going to make it here at a couple points on that road, but Sally handled it like a champ, although she's a little bit dirty from that excursion. Hoping the ride out isn't too bad, but we're not going to worry about that right now because we are going to get started on this hike. From the trailhead, we still had a mile and a half to hike to reach the Devil's Playground, including a water crossing in freezing temperatures. Oh my gosh, this water's so cold. We've made it to the Devil's Playground. The temperatures have started dropping and it started snowing, which was not in the forecast at all. The snow didn't last for long and it melted pretty quickly, which made a mess of things. Our boots were muddy and heavy and the dogs were gonna need a good bath, but the trail was beautiful. The rock formations were unique and they sat alongside colored badlands.
At times, the trail looked like the surface of another planet. The whole trail took us a few hours, and we were exhausted, but we still had to get home. So we're backing up to the top of the hill. It looks like there's a spot that we can turn around because it's definitely too soft at the bottom of the hill. There's a big washout in one spot. That's really my main concern, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah, it does not look good, it's but momentum. I'm trying. I just, I can't get too much momentum because then I'll bottom out. Woo! Oh, we're spinning. Oh. <laughs> wow, there's some fish tailing going on there, but it was good fish tailing. Oh, not, gosh. not the bad kind, don't get stuck there. Now we gotta keep my momentum. I might, there's no traction right now. <laughs> like we could end up anywhere. <laughs> Just kidding. I do know what I'm doing. Kind of. There's one more bad patch coming up right now. And it looks like it got worse since we came in, so that's fun. Oh my gosh. Come on. Come on. Nope. Poor vehicle. No, it's fine. Oh my lanta. Oh my lanta. That's not a good one. <laughs> Oh my lord. I know, I gotta keep the... Oh gosh. It's all right, it's all right. That is some bad I trust you. fish tailing right there. Woo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> hey, I think we did it. I think we made it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Once we finished up at the Petrified Forest, we were ready to move on to Phoenix. But first, we made a quick stop in Winslow at Meteor Crater. We just left Holbrook and we are on the road again. We decided to stop and pull off at the Meteor Crater to check it out. Thank you. Meteor Crater was a quick stop on the east side of Flagstaff. This national landmark preserves the impact site of the Canyon Diablo Meteor. Meteor Crater has a museum and a theater, but its main attraction is the Meteor Crater itself. This crater is 560 feet deep with a diameter of three quarters of a mile. It's big. From Meteor Crater, we headed south to Phoenix. Phoenix is a great hiking town. There's state parks and regional mountain parks throughout the area, and some of them make for some pretty amazing hikes. Once we got settled, we didn't waste any time. We headed straight for our first trail, Pinnacle Peak in Scottsdale. This was a great trail. It was busy, but it never felt crowded. It was well kept, and it gave us a decent workout. Pinnacle Peak also had some great views, and it provided us with our first clear view of Four Peaks, a jagged mountain that dominates the eastern skyline of Phoenix. A tempting view for hikers, to say the least. The next night, we made our way to another local favorite. Today we are at Camelback Mountain in Paradise Valley. We're gonna do the Echo Canyon to Camelback Mountain Trail. It's supposed to be a tough trail, we'll see. This is one of the most popular hikes in Phoenix, and it's a proving ground for local hikers. It's only 1.2 miles to the peak, but it has 1,400 feet of elevation gain along the way. It's a climb. <sighs> Turns out it's a little bit of a workout. We're on our last stretch though, about to make it to the top. We cut a little tight, but we made it, and it's not too bad of a view from the peak. Phoenix also had some great places for post-hike treats. Our favorite was the Sicilian Butcher. The Butcher had charcuterie trays and homemade meatballs, and they were delicious. We might have gone more than once. Aside from hiking, there were plenty of other things to do in the area. We visited Scottsdale's Butterfly Wonderland. This is one of the largest butterfly conservatories in the U.S., with over 3,000 butterflies in the park, and the rainforest enclosure made for some beautiful scenes. The next night we made a trip to Casa Grande to visit the Neon Sign Park. 
These signs were salvaged and restored by a local nonprofit in an effort to preserve this aspect of the area's history. The signs light up the sky until 11 p.m. each night. That weekend, Morgan flew back to Florida to visit family for a week. So I had to keep busy. I decided to hike everything I could around Phoenix. Some trails were better than others. South Mountain and Thunderbird were uneventful. And Hole in the Rock at Papago Park wasn't really even a hike. Plus, the crowds were insane. Although other trails offered some great moments. Skyline Regional Park provided expansive views of the western Phoenix landscape. Views that felt epic. The next night, my hike at Lake Pleasant had some special guests along the trail. Arizona has the largest population of wild burros in the U.S., and they're adorable. Another local favorite, Piastua Peak, made my legs feel like noodles when it rose 1,200 feet over a one-mile hike to the peak. And it had plenty of steps and scrambles to keep me busy along the way. And while hiking the White Bank Mountains, a couple coyotes decided to join me on my hike. But without a doubt, the best trail of the week was the flat iron. So today I am up at the Lost Dutchman State Park and I'm gonna do the flat iron trail. Kinda of thought it wasn't a big trail, but the mountain actually looks pretty epic. The flat iron serves as a gateway to the superstition wilderness and the stunning Superstition Mountains. I had no idea what I was getting into with this trail. Apaches believe the Superstition Mountains contain a hole that leads to hell. At times, the flat iron made me feel like I was approaching that hole. I'm on the last big stretch of climbing before I get to the saddle, and then it's a short walk over to the flat iron, but it's pretty much all uphill climbing from here. This trail rose 2,300 feet in the last mile and a half. The flat iron worked my legs and left me winded. To call it a hike would be generous. Getting to the top mostly meant scrambling and climbing. But reaching the top felt so good. With a great week of hiking behind me, I picked Morgan up from the airport and we headed north to Sedona. We got settled at Dead Horse Ranch State Park. Then we headed to the Red Rock Scenic Byway. This road passes most of Sedona's major rock formations. And for us, as first time visitors, it was a great way to get familiar with the area. We headed back to the bus with big things planned for the next day, but things don't always go as planned. Turns out a winter storm swept through overnight and dropped six inches of snow on us. It was inconvenient, but the dogs had fun, and the snow melted by the afternoon, so we were ready to hit the trails, albeit muddy trails. We visited Sedona in January, so there was still a lot of ice and snow, but that didn't bother us. We're happy to throw on some spikes and a jacket if it means that we get to hike without crowds. And the crowds were minimal. The Devil's Bridge is one of the most popular trails in Sedona, and we had it practically to ourselves. Airport Mesa was our least favorite trail of our state. The trail had some nice views, but overall it just didn't do it for us. Bell Rock, on the other hand, gave us a special treat, with these blue birds greeting us at the start of our hike. The hike at Bell Rock was pretty straightforward and flat, but it had beautiful scenery as the trail circled Bell Rock and the courthouse. 
Our next stop was Soldier Pass. We got there early to beat the crowds because this trail can get packed, even in the winter. With landmarks like the Seven Sacred Pools and the Soldier Pass Cave, this trail did not disappoint. Beyond hiking, Sedona kept us busy in other ways. We found delicious restaurants, including the Cowboy Club and Pizza Lisa, which was the best pizza we had in Arizona. And we tried Pizzeria Bianco in Phoenix. In our opinion, Pizza Lisa was better. Also, it's no secret that we like donuts. And Sedonuts were our favorite donuts in Arizona. Every donut we got was perfect, and we got plenty of them. Sedona also had other landmarks to explore. Talacapaque had some amazing artists on display, as well as some pricey but tasty cheesecake. The Chapel of the Holy Cross displayed beautiful architecture while providing one of the best overlooks in Sedona. We also took a day trip to the little mountain town of Jerome, which is 30 minutes west of Sedona. The town of Jerome is built into the Black Hills of Prescott National Forest. It once served as a robust mining town, but now it's known as a ghost town. Although it has bounced back in recent years. Jerome had some great shops, interesting scenery, and plenty of restaurants. It was well worth the visit. The next day we hit the trail at Boynton Canyon. This trail was beautiful, and the winter conditions added to the beauty. Once we reached the end of the canyon, we backtracked and made a stop at the Subway Cave. This cave was popular and crowded, but we loved the Boynton Canyon Trail. And we even made some friends along the way. Their names were Helen and Tim. They love traveling too, so check out their channel. At this point, we only had a couple days left in Sedona, and one of those days happened to be my birthday. Morgan thought we should do something fun. So we rented a Can-Am side-by-side -side and ventured into the Coconino National Forest. Sedona has dedicated ATV trails full of rough terrain, holes, and puddles. Perfect for ATVs. Of course, I didn't have all the fun. Morgan was happy to take the helm. Are you ready? I am. Morgan, let's go! <laughs> While we were checking in, the rep made sure to let me know there'd be a $50 cleaning fee for excessive mud. I'd say that was $50 well spent. Sedona's most iconic trail ended up being our favorite trail during our stay. Cathedral Rock should be on every hiker's bucket list. It isn't a long trail, but it's a good climb. And its views are amazing, especially at sunset. And with that, we wrapped up our stay in Sedona, although we'd be back before we left the state. We headed back to Phoenix for a few days, but not before having some issues. Halfway through our trip to Phoenix, the bus started hemorrhaging coolant, so we were stuck on the interstate while I tried to figure out the problem. I found a leaky coolant line, and I hoped that was the only issue. So I used the only thing I had to fix it, electrical tape. It didn't completely fix the issue, but it bought us time. I took water from the bus's freshwater tank and used it in the radiator, then nursed the bus along to Phoenix. Once we were in Phoenix, we found even more amazing trails. Scottsdale gave us another gem with the Tom's Thumb Trail. This was the perfect evening hike. It was a decent climb, and it had a natural landmark at the end, Tom's Thumb. 
Next, we tackled the Usury Mountain Regional Park and the Pass Mountain Summit. This trail is relatively well known for the Wind Caves Trail, which makes up the first mile and a half. But once we got past the Wind Caves, no one else was on the trail. This part of the trail took us up to a rocky ridge line that we had to climb up and scramble across in order to reach the summit. This trail was pretty epic. Our last trail in the area took us back to the Superstition Mountains. Today we are in the Superstition Wilderness and we are headed out to Weaver's Needle. This trail takes you up Peralta Canyon to the most well-known landmark in the Superstition Mountains, Weaver's Needle. We made it to the Needle, it's a really cool landmark, and now we're going to make lunch and head up. It's amazing that there are so many hikes like this less than an hour from Phoenix. The bus ended up being a quick fix. All we had to do was replace the hose and flush the system. With the bus patched up and running properly, we headed to Payson, because we had a date with Four Peaks. Payson, Arizona sits an hour and a half northeast of Phoenix, and it's known as the heart of Arizona. The area has snow-covered peaks and gorgeous waterfalls, and it's surrounded by national forests. So it has some good hikes. We started with a quick hike to Waterwheel Falls. It was a nice hike, but this was more about letting the dogs have a good time in the river. Next, we visited the Tonto Natural Bridge State Park. This park has three small hikes, but its main attraction is the Tonto Natural Bridge. This bridge is 183 feet tall and 150 feet wide. There are four observation decks to view the natural bridge, but you can also take a small hike to the bottom. Standing under this bridge made us feel tiny, a feeling that became second nature while traveling through Arizona, and standing next to its natural monuments like the Grand Canyon and Monument Valley. The Payson area is also known for the Mugion Rim, this rocky rim stretches 200 miles across Arizona. In the summertime, it's a hot spot for hiking and camping, but in the winter, it's pretty well covered in snow. We also made an attempt to hike the Bob Bear Trail, but the trailhead is notoriously difficult to navigate in the winter, and we didn't want to get the car stuck. So we tried hiking another local trail, and we ended up getting the car stuck in that trailhead. We tried digging it out, but that didn't work. We got a ride into town so we could get some kitty litter and pour it under the tires. That didn't work either. Then this guy showed up with a chain and a big truck. He had us out in a couple minutes. We were grateful. It was a rough day, and we didn't get to do any hiking. So we headed back to the bus and got ready to hike Four Peaks. Four Peaks isn't a huge mountain by any means. It's only 7,659 feet tall, but it's an intriguing mountain that catches the gaze of onlookers from across the region. Brown's Peak is the northernmost and highest peak of the four. The other three peaks don't have official names, but the locals call them Brother Peak, Sister Peak, and Amethyst Peak, named after the amethyst mine hidden in the rock. Getting to the trailhead can be difficult, there are two roads. The western approach needs a high clearance, four-wheel drive vehicle, which we don't have. So we approached from the east. This was 11 miles of dirt road that took 45 minutes to clear. But the views as we approached the mountain were amazing. Finally, we reached the trailhead and started working our way towards the peak. The trail was beautiful and quiet. Very few people hike this trail in the winter, and there's a reason. But we'll get back to that. 
the higher elevations required spikes. Even the trail was covered with ice in some spots. But the winter conditions weren't an issue, and we made it to the saddle pretty easily. The saddle had a beautiful view of the peaks and the valleys below. This is also where things got interesting. In order to get to Brown's Peak, we had to scramble over rocks for a quarter of a mile. Which was a little rough with winter conditions, but doable. Then we reached the Scree Chute. This is where the final ascent to the peak takes place. The last tenth of a mile climbs 600 feet, which can be difficult in normal conditions, but these weren't normal conditions. Even so, we started working our way up the chute. spot coming up that looks a little bit dicey. Not sure we're gonna be able to pass because there's a lot of ice. It looks like it might get a little loose there. And when you're doing a hike or a climb like this, you can't just think about the way up. You gotta think about coming back down and how bad that's gonna be. So we're not trying to kill ourselves today, just trying to have a good time. This part was questionable. The peak was in sight and I could see a path to the top. But coming down would have meant blindly descending several feet to a tiny foothold with barely anything to grip. Sadly, we wouldn't be reaching the peak. We got past the sketchy part, but then we found another even more sketchy part. So we are gonna go ahead and call it a day. We would have loved to have made it to the peak, but it just wasn't gonna happen today. Although, <laughs> we had some fun getting back down the chute. We made lunch and enjoyed the views. Then we headed home and set out for Tucson. We found a little farmstead to stay at while we were in Tucson. Once we got hooked up, we headed to our first hike. It's our first day in Tucson, so today we are going to be hiking Picacho Peak. This hike starts with a constant climb to the saddle. The peak is only 1,500 feet taller than the park that surrounds it, but the trail has 2,100 feet of elevation gain. After the saddle, the trail dips 600 feet before the final approach to the peak. This is where the Picacho Peak Trail shines. This final section of trail is a tough workout with cables, scaffolding, and some difficult climbs. All of this makes the trail challenging and fun. Plus, the peak is a great place to kick back and enjoy beautiful views of the Sonoran Desert. Cheers! <laughs> We made it to Picacho Peak. There's some good views up here. Definitely a good workout and a tough hike. And now we are gonna go get some well-deserved Mexican food. Tucson is only an hour north of the Mexican border, so it has some good Mexican food. Many Tucsonians even boast that it's the best Mexican food in the U.S., and it's hard to argue. Tacos Apson had the best carne asada we've ever tasted. Rollies had amazing rolled tacos and open-faced enchiladas, but the best was Cafe El Charo. They've been around for decades, and their cheese crisps and chimichangas were delicious. Of course, we couldn't visit the area without trying a local delicacy, the Sonoran Hot Dog. The Sonoran Hot Dog has a warm bun and a bacon-wrapped hot dog, plus all the fixings. If you're in the area, you have to try one. During our stay in Tucson, we also spent some time in Saguaro National Park. This park was established in 1933. Back then, it was only a national monument. But in 1994, it became the U.S.'s 54th National Park. The park's purpose has been to help preserve the giant saguaro cactus. The park is full of saguaros in all shapes and sizes, including some interestingly unique saguaros. 
This national park has two scenic drives and several small trails that lead to different landmarks. But its most popular trail is Wasson Peak. This trail takes you through forests of cacti that sit along hillsides. It's a dry trail with little to no shade, so it can get hot in the summer. Luckily, we hiked it in February, so it wasn't too high. Once we reached the top, we were rewarded with beautiful views of Tucson and Mount Lemmon. At 9,159 feet, Mount Lemmon is the tallest mountain in Tucson's Santa Catalina Mountains, and the Mount Lemmon Scenic Drive provides a great opportunity to enjoy the mountain. This is a 27-mile road that stretches from the Sonoran Desert landscape in Tucson up to Alpine Forests at the peak. The drive to the top was beautiful, and these were the best views that we found in the Tucson area. At the base of those same mountains is Sabino Canyon, which is home to one of the most popular trails in Tucson. Today I am in Sabino Canyon and I am doing the Seven Falls Trail. This trail has beautiful scenery as it winds through the canyon and alongside Bear Creek. The trail has several water crossings as it cuts through Bear Creek. That water is so cold and people are doing everything they can to keep from getting in the water. Of course, I just sucked it up and went across because the boots are going to dry. I hiked this one in February, so the snow was melting off of Mount Lemmon, which made the creek brutally cold. But that also meant Seven Falls was flowing strong. These are seven small falls that cascade down the mountainside to create Bear Creek. In between hikes, we stayed busy at some of Tucson's best attractions. We visited Mission San Xavier del Bac, which is Arizona's most well-known mission. Also known as the White Dove of the Desert, this beautiful church is still in use today. We also visited Tucson's Desert Museum. This attraction puts the Sonoran ecosystem on full display, with exhibits and wildlife, including coyotes, bobcats, javelinas, Mexican wolves, and much, much more. We really enjoyed this stop. We also took a drive to Tombstone, Arizona. If you enjoy westerns, this is the place to see. Horse-drawn coaches tour the streets. Gunfights break out in saloons. And there are several museums to honor the most notorious gunfighters in the Wild West. We ate lunch at Big Nose Kate's, then explored the town. Then we finished our day by watching Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday battle the cowboys at the OK Corral. Tombstone was a bit touristy, and at times it was even a little cheesy but it was fun. I also took a solo trip to the southeast corner of Arizona and Chiricahua National Monument. This park is known as the Wonderland of Rocks and it's one of Arizona's best kept secrets. But to be fair, this national monument is remote. It's a two hour drive from Tucson. Chiricahua's main attraction is the Heart of Rocks Loop which can be accessed through Echo Canyon or the Visitor Center Trail. Both trails include beautiful views of the canyon and the rhyolite hoodoos that make this park unique. Three miles into the hike, I reached the Heart of Rocks Loop. The loop is one mile long and it boasts some of the most unique rock formations in the state. These formations include Pinnacle Balanced Rock, Big Balanced Rock, Thor's Hammer, 
and several more. This trail was incredibly unique, and it ended up being one of my favorite trails in the state. Before leaving Tucson, we got one more surprise. We were coming home after a hike and we passed our hosts on the road and they offered us tickets to the rodeo. So today, we are going to the rodeo here in Tucson. Morgan loves the rodeo and the Tucson rodeo is a big deal. Cowboys and cowgirls come from across the U.S. to compete, and it's a tough ticket to get. We grabbed some fry bread and headed to our seats to watch the action. It started with bronc riding. Next was steer wrestling but the steers were a little slippery on the day. That was followed by roping. And the barrel racing was something special. These horses were impressive. But by far, the most impressive side of the day was this. Seriously, he was riding full speed in a full bodysuit. He even danced in that suit. Of course, the main event was the bull riding. These riders were tough, but sometimes you wonder why cowboys do the things they do. Tucson had been good to us, but it was time to move on. So we headed to Ajo to start exploring Western Arizona. Ajo isn't a big town. It has a population of 3,000 people and there isn't a lot to do, but it's home to Organ Pipe Cactus National Monument. So we made a quick stop to visit the park. Established in 1937, the park provides a haven for its namesake cactus, the Organ Pipe Cactus. Named for its resemblance to the pipes of an old organ, this cactus can live up to 150 years while growing over 20 feet tall. This national monument also has some good hiking options, and most of the trails are accessed through Ajo Mountain Drive. This is a 21 mile unpaved road and it's one way, so once you get started, it's a long way to the end. We jumped on the scenic drive and headed to the park's most popular hike, Arch Canyon Trail. This hike winds through a small canyon with organ pipe cacti decorating the sides of the trail. Arch Canyon was a relatively short trail, but it had a good amount of elevation gain, and the rocky red canyon was beautiful. Natural Arch sits at the end of the trail, and it's the perfect spot to enjoy a beautiful Sonoran sunset. Working our way west, we made another quick stop in Yuma. We stayed in Yuma for a few days. It has a cute downtown with a great pizza place. We took an afternoon adventure to the Yuma Territorial Prison. This prison saw its heyday in the late 1800s, when it housed some of the worst outlaws in the state, including the famed stagecoach robber Pearl Hart, although it seems like they had trouble holding on to some of their inmates. We also hiked a couple local trails. They were rocky and dry with very little in the way of scenic views. And we were glad we weren't on these trails in the middle of summer. From Yuma, we headed north to Arizona's oasis, Lake Havasu City. 
Lake Havasu is a beautiful reservoir that sits just inside of Arizona's western boundary. And the area legitimately feels like a beach town. It has great restaurants, several state parks, and the Sarah Park. This is a regional park that has a ton of stuff to do, including mountain biking, a speedway, and the Crack in the Mountain Trail. Also known as the Sarah Crack Trail, this was a nice hidden gem. The trail starts with rocky, desert terrain as it follows a wash into a small slot canyon. The little canyon was beautiful, and it made for a nice afternoon adventure but we'd see some better slot canyons before we left Arizona. The most popular attraction in Lake Havasu is the London Bridge. This bridge was built in 1830, in London, England. It used to span the River Thames, but in 1962, the city of London deemed the bridge wasn't strong enough for modern traffic. So a real estate developer bought the bridge and had its exterior stones disassembled and transported to Lake Havasu City. The bridge was then rebuilt in its current location with a few modifications. Now the London Bridge draws visitors from across the U.S. During our time in western Arizona, we also visited Prescott. Prescott's known for its cowboys and rodeo. It's said to have the world's oldest rodeo, having hosted it since 1888. The town is also home to Whiskey Row, originally named for its many saloons, including the Palace, which was frequented by Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday back in the day. While we enjoyed Prescott's history, we also enjoyed its trails. Prescott is home to the Granite Dells. These are lumpy granite boulders that make for some nice scenery along the trails. Our first trail was Watson Lake, which is a man-made reservoir that sits within the Dells. This gives the trail very unique scenery. Next, we hike the Constellation Loop. This trail weaves through the Granite Dells, and it's not too long, so it makes for a nice afternoon hike. The Prescott area also has a large population of pronghorn. From a distance, they can easily be mistaken for deer. But pronghorn have unmistakable white patches of fur on their throats, bellies, and rears. Also known as the American antelope, pronghorn are the fastest land mammals in the United States, with the capability of reaching close to 60 miles an hour. Our next stop was Kingman. Kingman is another big Route 66 stop. Known as the heart of Route 66, Kingman is proud to celebrate the history of the Mother Road. We started with a stop at the Kingman Visitor Center, which has a full Route 66 museum with tons of relics from the old road. It also has a great photo op. Also, if you want an authentic Route 66 experience, then you have to stop at Mr. D's Route 66 Diner. This little diner radiates vintage Americana, and the burgers were delicious. Kingman is also surrounded by mountains, so I ventured into a local mountain park for a hike. Today I'm at Wallapai Mountain Park, looking to hike up to Wallapai Peak. Morgan and I have both been sick for the last week. I got sick first, so she's still sick. But we've got a big hike coming up next week, and so I gotta get my legs under me because we snagged a last minute cancellation to have a suit by falls, and that's a big hike. This was a great hike in the snow. The forest was beautiful, and the potato patch had some beautiful formations. Although it did get a little eerie once I reached Camp Levi Levi. The haze, along with large paw prints, were a little off putting. Then the emergency shelter had holes in the back of it with chunks taken out of the beams. The area started feeling like the set of a horror movie. But I kept moving towards the peak. 
So I opted to go for the peak and the clouds are clearing up a little bit. Still not sure if I'm gonna get any clear views at the top. Right now I'm 0.9 away, but it looks like there's gonna be about 800 feet of elevation gain in that last 0.8, so gonna be rough. At Wallapai Peak, the clouds only provided a couple views into the valley, but all in all it was a good hike, although I did decide to bypass the campground on the way out. While in Kingman, we also made the long drive to Grand Canyon West. Grand Canyon West is known for its skywalk. This is a glass overlook that you can walk on and view the western edge of the Grand Canyon. The skywalk was unique and beautiful. But beyond that, the park didn't have much to do. Also, the park doesn't allow cameras on the skywalk, so we were at the mercy of the Grand Canyon West photographers. Five photos cost us $50. Grand Canyon West had beautiful scenery, but it felt like they nickel and dimed us until we left the park, and that left a bad taste in our mouths. Our next stop was the Havasupai Campground, and reservations for the campground are tough to get. The area is popular because of the beautiful blue water that flows down Havasu Creek, winding its way down to the area's iconic waterfalls, most notably Havasu Falls. But that wasn't the scene we found. We woke up early to make the two hour drive from Kingman to the Wallapai Hilltop Trailhead so we could get an early start. To start early we had to check in the day before, so we drove an hour to the Grand Canyon Caverns and Inn so we could sign the paperwork and get our permits. We're about five minutes out from the Hilltop Trailhead, that's the starting point for our hike down to Supai Village. It looks like it's going to be a pretty tough hike, but hopefully it's a fun day. Yay. If we didn't check in a day early, then we'd have to wait until 8 a.m. to check in, then drive an hour to the trailhead, so we wouldn't be able to start hiking until 9.30. But this is a long hike, and we wanted to give ourselves plenty of time. The village of Supai is the only town in the Grand Canyon. The village is remote, and there are only two ways to get to the village a helicopter ride, or the hiking trail. The helicopter ride only takes 15 minutes, which sounded nice, but we opted to hike to the village. The hike from the trailhead to Supai Village is eight miles, and the campground is another two miles past the village. So we had a long day ahead of us, but we were hiking into the Grand Canyon, so we were excited. The hike begins with a series of descending switchbacks. The trail loses 1,100 feet of elevation in the first mile, something we were not looking forward to on the way back. From there, the trail continues into the Wallapai Canyon, losing elevation with every step. The trail through the canyon was rocky but beautiful. We were surrounded by sandstone cliffs with pack mules running past us. This is one of the easier parts of the hike because it's downhill, but we still took plenty of breaks. After all, we were carrying all of our camping supplies for the trip. We had all of the basics and some. We had our meals, coffee mugs and coffee, cooking propane, a lantern, sleeping bags, cookware, a stove, sleeping pads, pillows, a tent, solar battery packs, headlamps, and towels. Plus, we had our clothes. We had some weight on our backs. So while this part of the trail was easier, it wasn't easy by any means. We kept working our way down the trail, and after five hours, we made it to Supai Village.
There was flash flooding, so the creek was muddy and running high, which meant the falls were probably muddy too. On our way through the village, we stopped at the Supai Cafe for some fry bread and a Supai Taco, which is fry bread topped with beef, pinto beans, cheese, and lettuce. It was a nice treat after eight miles of hiking. We finished up and started the two mile hike to the campground. This part of the trail has three waterfalls, 50 foot falls, Navajo Falls, and Havasu Falls, but the flash flooding created some issues. We couldn't reach 50 foot falls because the trail was covered by water. Navajo Falls was a muddy mess. Also, the bridge to cross the creek was washed out one week prior, and it was replaced with this bridge. This bridge sits 40 yards upstream from Havasu Falls, and the water was raging. One wrong step could be fatal. Not something you want to see when your legs are wobbly after 10 miles of hiking with a large pack. We made our way to the campground, but not before stopping to admire Havasu Falls. While the falls were muddy, they were still beautiful, albeit different than we were expecting. Finally, we reached the campground, but we had to set up camp in the rain. It was a rough day. The river's running pretty hard right now. We're hoping it'll slow down over the next couple of days. Maybe the water will clear up. All we can do is wait and see. But right now, all of the falls are muddy and murky and they are bursting at the seams. On top of that, all of the trails are closed right now. We can't hike to Beaver Falls. We can't hike to Mooney Falls. We can't hike to the Confluence. So again, we're hoping the river slows down a little bit and clears up over the next couple of days or else we might be a little bored. Our first night didn't bring much rest. Storms and flash flooding filled the night, and rangers were evacuating campsites. Luckily, we didn't have to evacuate. The second day wasn't very eventful. The falls and creek were still rushing, and all of the major hikes were still closed so we had to fill our time elsewhere. We went to the base of the falls, then we crossed the bridge and hiked back into the village to grab a snack. Then Morgan made some hot cocoa and we watched the stars from the top of Havasu Falls. Seated quite a bit last night. The hike down to Mooney is technically closed, but we can still get to the top of the waterfall, so we're at least going to do that. Mooney was flowing with power, and it was beautiful. But it was 9.30 in the morning and we had exhausted our last hiking option. So we decided to cut our losses and head home a day early. The hike back to the trailhead was going to be rough. The trail has close to 2,800 feet of elevation gain. Even with plenty of snacks and breaks, this hike was tough, especially the last mile. The last mile alone has 1,100 feet of elevation gain. It was brutal. When we got close to the trailhead, we stopped one last time to take in the views. It might have been a rough weekend, but we just backpacked into the Grand Canyon, and that was something special. The next morning, we packed up and headed to Williams. Williams is another major stop on Route 66, but it's also known as the gateway to the Grand Canyon. So we parked the bus and drove an hour to the South Rim. Neither one of us had been to Grand Canyon National Park in the past, so we were excited. Our first day in the park was short. 
we hiked a portion of the rim and walked alongside the canyon. We found ourselves stopping time and time again to take in the view. We had seen photos of the Grand Canyon, but we both agreed that photos don't do it justice. We enjoyed a beautiful sunset over the canyon from Yaki Point, and we were hooked. We had to see more of the canyon. The park has amazing overlooks along the whole south rim. On the western side of the park, Hermit's Rest, Pima Point, and Mather Point offered new perspectives of the canyon. And on the eastern side of the park, the Desert View Watchtower offered even more views. But this wasn't enough for us. We wanted more. We wanted to hike to the bottom of the canyon and see the Colorado River up close. So we decided to try our luck with the Phantom Ranch. The Phantom Ranch is a rustic lodge that sits at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. As you can imagine, reservations are tough to come by. Normally, in order to make a reservation, you have to win a lottery 13 months in advance. We didn't win the lottery, but instead we capitalized on the cancellation, and we reserved a cabin at the ranch. Safe to say we were excited. The next morning we woke up early and headed to the park, ready for a long hike. Grand Canyon National Park is home to some iconic hikes. South Kaibab and Bright Angel are two of those hikes, both of which lead to the Phantom Ranch. We started on South Kaibab and made our way down the canyon. The beginning of South Kaibab is known as the Chimney because of its steep descent into the canyon. Switchbacks take you down more than 800 feet in the first mile, but this was just a taste of what was ahead of us. Over the next seven miles, the South Kaibab Trail would descend almost 5,000 feet down into the canyon. The elevation change would be difficult, but the trail provided epic views to keep us motivated. One mile into the trail is South Kaibab's first overlook, Ua Point. It was named for the sounds that onlookers make when they see the views. A mile and a half into the trail, we reach the second overlook, Cedar Ridge. Cedar Ridge offers panoramic views of the canyon, and it was a great place to take a break. After Cedar Ridge, the crowds thinned out, and there were stretches when we had the trail mostly to ourselves, although we did run into a few of the locals. The pack mules were working hard, the squirrels were overly friendly, and the bighorn sheep were relaxing on the cliffs around us. We hiked another mile and a half to Skeleton Point. At Skeleton Point, we got our first glance at the Colorado River. From here, the views became more spectacular. We weren't above the canyon anymore. Now we were in it. We couldn't help but get pulled into the grandeur around us. Moments like these make you feel small. In a good way. Finally, after hours of hiking, we made it to the Black Bridge, and it was time to cross the Colorado River. The Black Bridge was built in 1928 and stretches 440 feet over the Colorado River. From there, it was a short walk to the Phantom Ranch. The Phantom Ranch was built in 1922, and it's the only lodge that sits below the rim. It's nestled in the canyon surrounded by beautiful scenery. The lodge has a snack shop, a food hall, and a shower house, all of which are nice treats at the end of a long hike. We checked in and headed to our cabin, and our cabin had everything we needed for a comfortable night in the canyon. We had a sink, a bathroom, power, fresh linens, and a big comfy bed. We were pretty happy. Once we got settled, we checked out the area. We hiked a couple miles on North Kaibab, and we bought postcards and mailed them out from the bottom of the canyon. 
but the best part of our stay was dinner. We had a hearty down-home meal with salad, cornbread, and the main course, beef stew. Once we wrapped up dinner, we called it a night. Check out at the Phantom Ranch is 7.30 in the morning, so we ate a big breakfast and headed out. Leaving the ranch, the trail moved alongside Bright Angel Creek before leading us to the Silver Bridge to cross the Colorado River for the last time. From here, the river trail walked us next to the mighty Colorado for a mile and a quarter, gaining elevation the whole way. Finally, we reached the Bright Angel Trail. The Bright Angel Trail is one of the most iconic national park trails in the U.S. Bright Angel is filled with legendary landscapes and picturesque scenes. The trail is epic, but it also comes with significant elevation gain. We'd be gaining 4,500 feet over the course of this seven and a half mile trail. But just like South Kaibab, the incredible views help to distract us from the elevation change. We took plenty of breaks, but with each switchback we pushed closer to the top. And by the time we reached the rim, we couldn't even see back to where we started. After an epic stay at the Grand Canyon, we moved just up the road to Flagstaff. The most notable hike in Flagstaff is Humphreys Peak, which is the highest point in Arizona. So that was the first stop. The trail was gorgeous. The sun was peeking through the pines, and there were snow-covered landscapes in the distance. Unfortunately, the snow was deep. I wouldn't be conquering Humphrey anytime soon, and most of the trails around Flagstaff were in the same condition. So we looked for other options to keep us busy. Luckily, Flagstaff has plenty of options. There are four national monuments within an hour of Flagstaff. First was Montezuma Castle. This was a quick stop. The monument has a half mile paved path that takes visitors past a 20 room living space that was carved into a limestone cliff by the Sanagua Indians. This was an incredible sight. Next was Wupatki National Monument. This monument preserves Pueblo sites and even allows visitors to walk through the ruins. 900 years ago, these Pueblos were destroyed by a volcanic eruption. The next national monument was dedicated to the volcano that wiped out Wupatki. Sunset Crater Volcano National Monument is centered around its namesake volcano, but it has some unique trails that make it worth visiting. Some trails stand in the shadow of the volcano, while other trails, like the Lava's Edge Trail, walk over and next to old lava flows, creating some very unique settings. But our favorite national monument was Walnut Canyon. This monument had a couple notable trails. The Rim Trail is a relatively flat path with great views down into the canyon. The Island Trail follows 368 stairs down to the remnants of a cliffside community, with many of these old homes seemingly straddling the edge. The hike only takes an hour, but we were passing history with every step. We also found some good food in Flagstaff, with two places being our favorite. Tourist Home Cafe had churro donuts, which were our second favorite donuts in Arizona. But our favorite restaurant in Flagstaff was Diablo Burger. These burgers were cooked to perfection and they were the best burgers we had in Arizona. 
Our last stop in Flagstaff was Picture Canyon. This is a very nice city park that has trails alongside a small canyon. And it was a beautiful place for an afternoon stroll with the dogs. Since most of the trails in the area were still covered in snow, we had to venture into other areas to hike. Luckily, Flagstaff is conveniently located, and Sedona was just down the road. So after a quick stop at Sedona's, we hit the trail. Today we're back in Sedona. Didn't really see that coming, but we came up here to hike Bear Mountain. Bear Mountain was a workout. 2,000 feet of elevation gain stood between us and the peak. Also, just to make things better, there were false peaks which is great for morale. But we kept pushing and we made it to the peak. The peak had some nice views, but this one was about the workout. A few days later, we headed to one of Sedona's most popular trails, West Fork. West Fork is nestled in Oak Creek Canyon, just off of the Oak Creek Canyon scenic drive. This drive connects Flagstaff and Sedona, and it's known for its spectacular views. West Fork is a beautiful trail, but there's a catch. The trail has 13 water crossings. And for us, the water was higher than normal. And it was cold because of the snow melt. We worked our way up the stream, as the trail curled under steep red rock canyons in the heart of Coconino National Forest. The trail was wet and cold, and there wasn't a lot of elevation gain. But it ended up being one of our favorite trails in Sedona. Before leaving Flagstaff for northern Arizona, I still had one more loose end to tie up. So I took a day trip to Tonto National Forest and the Bob Bear Trail. This trail is regularly ranked as one of Arizona's best hikes, so I had to check it out. The hike in is pretty straightforward and relatively easy, because it's all downhill, which means the hike out would be a joy. The trails were dusty and there were beautiful red rocks in the distance. At times it felt like I was back in Sedona. And as I approached the three mile mark I started to hear the sound of rushing water. This is why the Bob Bear Trail is so popular. It leads to a beautiful creek with a hidden spring. The area was serene, and I could have sat here for hours. And when I hiked another half mile, the trail provided another treat. The Fossil Creek Dam is well known to hikers and swimmers in the area. During the summer, people can be seen jumping from the falls. Some even jump into the toilet bowl, which has an underwater cave leading back to the main stream. I wouldn't be getting in the water on this hike, but it was still a nice view and a great trail. We enjoyed Flagstaff, even if we couldn't do everything we wanted, but I made it a point to come back once it warmed up, so I could take on Humphreys Peak in the proper manner. So I made the winding drive back up to the Arizona Snow Bowl and set out for the peak. The trail through the forest was quiet, with the sun peeking through the trees, as I worked my way into the Kachina Peaks wilderness. As the elevation rose, the path became rocky, and the tree line began to open. Thirty-three hundred feet of elevation over five miles is no small task, but I reached the saddle and the view of the valley was amazing. But I still had another mile left. The final mile was rocky and steep. The Forest Service placed guideposts, but the path wasn't always clear. Then, just when I thought I'd reached the top, there was a false peak. 
and another. But finally, I reached the summit and took in the views from Arizona's highest peak. We had a great stay in Flagstaff, but next we moved north to Page. Page, Arizona has several well-known landmarks. One of those landmarks is Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. This recreation area is made up of several locations, including the Glen Canyon Dam, Lee's Ferry, and Antelope Point, which also has an RV park, so that's where we parked the bus. Once we got set up, we headed to our first stop, the iconic Horseshoe Bend. Horseshoe Bend isn't really much of a hike, but its overlook is well known. A thousand feet below the overlook, the mighty Colorado cuts through Glen Canyon to make its way down to the Grand Canyon, and it creates some beautiful sights, with the best scenes coming at sunset. There were crowds, but we still had plenty of space to operate. The next day we took an hour drive to Lee's Ferry to hike Cathedral Wash. This trail follows the dry wash winding between towering cliffs as it works its way to the Colorado River. The trail was dry and rocky, but it was fun. The path wasn't clearly laid out. We had to climb and scramble to get to the end, and it felt like an adventure. We also had a nice surprise on our way home. These are California condors, North America's largest land bird. California condors average a wingspan of nine and a half feet. Unfortunately, these condors are endangered. There are only a little over 300 alive in the wild. Since we were in Page, we also had the opportunity to enter the lottery for the wave. This is a popular permitted hike in northern Arizona, and it's the toughest hiking permit to get in the state. And after 21 failed entries, we moved on with life. During our time in Page, we also toured its four most popular slot canyons. All of these canyons are on Navajo land, so they require a paid tour. These canyons are not freely open to hikers anymore. Also, prices are always changing, so do some research before you go. The first canyon was Canyon X. Canyon X was the best value out of the four. It was the least expensive and it had better sights than water holes. Water holes made the bottom of our list. It was a slot canyon, but it wasn't very deep, so the light was harsh. It was still nice, but we probably wouldn't do it again. Glen Canyon ended up being a great place to stay. For us and the dogs. We stayed busy on smaller trails. And the dogs got to swim almost every day. I think they were happy. Later that week, we headed back to Lee's Ferry, this time to hike the Spencer Trail. This one was tough. We were in the Arizona sun and there was no shade. As we kept climbing, the views became more spectacular until we felt like a speck on the side of a mountain. Northern Arizona is a land of towering monuments. Rocky buttes burst out of the ground and decorate the landscape as far as the eye can see. Canyon de Chez pays homage to one such monument. 
Spire Rock stands at nearly 800 feet tall. The Navajo named the spire after the Spider Woman, who in Navajo lore is a helper and a hero to their people. An hour to the east, Navajo National Monument reminds visitors that people use these rocks for shelter. Remnants of the Betatakan and Keatsil communities are left as examples to the ingenuity of the Navajo people. But without a doubt, the most notable rock monuments in northern Arizona sit within Monument Valley. With our time in Arizona nearing an end, we packed up our camping gear and made the two-hour drive to Monument Valley. After setting up camp, we headed to the Navajo Tribal Park to get our first look at Monument Valley. Sunset lit up the monuments, and the night sky brought a stellar scene. After breakfast, we packed up and headed to Monument Valley's main trail, the Wildcat Trail. We also made a new friend along the way. This is Scout. He was adorable. We couldn't take him, but by the end of the day, he found a new home. The Wildcat Trail is unique because it allowed us to hike around Monument Valley's most iconic buttes. The trail circles West Mitten Butte as it passes Merrick's Butte and East Mitten Butte, and it's the only self-guided hike in the tribal park. Its landscape is incredible, and this trail shouldn't be missed. From there, we did a quick loop around the scenic drive. Then we headed home. Our final adventures in Page took us to Antelope Canyon. We toured both the upper and lower canyons. These canyons are world-renowned, and they get busy, but they were breathtaking. Soft light trickles into the canyons and highlights the smooth, curved, sandstone walls. Even with the crowds and noise, we were in awe of the beauty we witnessed in these canyons. But our next stop in Arizona would turn our attention to a much larger canyon. When we left Page, we had some pretty epic adventures. We ventured into Zion National Park. We camped in the core zone of the enchantments. We spent two weeks in Glacier National Park, then Yellowstone, and the Tetons. But we still felt like Arizona had more to offer, so we ventured back into the state First, I took a solo trip to the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. The entrance of the North Rim sits four hours from the South Entrance, and the North Rim is 1,500 feet higher than the South Rim. The area is remote, so people tend to bypass this part of the park. This means the crowds are small, and it's much easier to find solitude. My first stop was Bright Angel Point. This overlook is a quick hike from the lodge, and it's the perfect place to watch the sunrise. From there, I headed to the Woodforce Trail. This is a nine mile trail that walks along the rim. The trail starts in the forest before passing Transept Canyon. The view was spectacular. The trail continued through the forest with views that provided small windows into the canyon. and the trees put fall colors on display. At the end of the trail, I reached Woodforce Point. This overlook provides a view to the southwest of the Grand Canyon, which isn't available anywhere else on the North Rim. 
Next I ventured to Cape Royal Road. This is the North Rim Scenic Drive, and it offers access to several hikes and overlooks, including Angel's Window and the Cape Royal Overlook. The views along the North Rim were spectacular, but a trip to the Grand Canyon is never complete until you hike into the canyon. So I got an early start and headed down one of the Grand Canyon's most iconic trails, North Kaibab. This is a long, steep trail. The entire trail stretches 14.2 miles to the Phantom Ranch, and the elevation change is almost 6,000 feet, which means the hike out is wonderful. I decided to take the trail to Roaring Springs. This was only 8.4 miles total, but there would be 3,500 feet of elevation gain on the way out, so the trail isn't easy by any means. The trail also had a few landmarks. Coconino Overlook provided the trail's first clear view into the canyon. The Supai Tunnel provided a transition into a breathtaking section of trail that overlooked the canyon and Redwall Bridge. The trail was steep and filled with switchbacks, but the hike into the canyon felt epic. The path curled around cliffs with incredible rock formations in the distance, and each turn had new scenery. After a couple hours of hiking, I reached Roaring Springs. The springs were a little underwhelming, but it made for a good spot to eat lunch before hiking out. And it was a rough hike out. At this point, we felt like we had explored the Grand Canyon thoroughly. But there was one section of the Grand Canyon that we needed to see again. So six months after our first trip, we found ourselves back in a familiar location hiking through Havasu Canyon in the hopes of reaching the beautiful waterfalls of the Havasupai Reservation. We drove up the day before. This time we decided to stay at the Grand Canyon Caverns Inn. The inn serves as the check-in location for the Havasupai trip, plus it's only an hour from the trailhead, so it's convenient. We checked in for the hike, then headed to our room. The room was nothing fancy, but it was reasonably priced and it was clean, so we were happy. Although the TV only had three channels, but we did have Wi-Fi. Once we got settled, we decided to look around a bit. The Grand Canyon Caverns Inn used to be a highlight along Route 66, but once the road was decommissioned, I-40 allowed traffic to bypass the area, so the inn fell in popularity. It was easy to tell that the inn had seen better days but it was a historic piece of classic Americana, so we enjoyed it for what it was. There was a decent restaurant and a grocery store, but the grocery store had a very limited stock. Our favorite part was the continental breakfast. It had waffles, bagels, coffee, cereal, and muffins. Plenty of carbs to prepare for the long hike into the Havasupai campground. After breakfast, we headed to the Wallapai Hilltop Trailhead. This time, we decided to use Havasupai's pack meal service. The process was straightforward, so we checked in our bags and started hiking, this time with much lighter packs. Unfortunately, we didn't know that the Havasupai pack mule system has come under scrutiny over the last few years. Horses have been mistreated and malnourished, so we wouldn't use the service again unless major changes were made to the system, but each visitor will have to make that decision for themselves. Havasu Canyon was just as beautiful as we left it. Plus, Morgan made some new friends along the trail. As we approached the village, we got our first glimpse of Havasu's beautiful water. An encouraging sight given our first trip. From the village, we hiked towards the campground. This stretch of trail has streams and waterfalls lining its western edge. Beautiful blue water winds its way to the canyon with picturesque views along the way.
We crossed the final bridge and made a quick stop at the Fry Bread Hut. A nice treat after 10 miles of hiking. Finally, as we walked further into the canyon, we got our first view of Havasu Falls. This was a welcome sight. Next, we set up camp. Havasupai doesn't assign campsites, so it's really a free-for-all. The southern edge of the campground sits close to Havasu Falls, while the northern edge of the campground sits close to Mooney Falls. There are almost always several beautiful sites to choose from. So we walked to the campground and found a campsite right on the water. And Morgan had a great place to set up the hammock. The next morning, we ate a big breakfast with pancakes and coffee. Then we got ready to explore the area. Havasupai has five main waterfalls, and some are easier to reach than others. Havasu Falls is the centerpiece, but we wanted to find the rest. First, we hiked a mile towards the village. We ventured through some short winding trails and climbed down to Navajo Falls. Navajo Falls doesn't look like it used to. In 2008, flash flooding swept through this area and redirected Havasu Creek. The power from the current also transformed and moved some of the waterfalls. Navajo Falls was affected along with 50 foot falls which was our second stop. Instead of following the path to Navajo Falls, hikers can go straight. This leads down to a small path with a sign pointing towards 50-foot falls. Following the trail leads to a covered area with a canopy of brush. The path goes over slippery rocks and flowing cascades before dropping into a waist-deep water crossing. From there, we navigated brush and reeds until we reached the waterfall. Fifty Foot Falls is tougher to access, and many visitors don't get to see it. Also, popular hiking apps have misplaced this waterfall, so many people don't even know it exists. Fifty Foot Falls is Havasupai's least crowded waterfall, but its beauty is undeniable. We ended our day with a warm meal and some relaxation at Havasu Falls. The next morning we set out early with the hope to hike to Beaver Falls. The beginning of this trail includes the infamous descent to the base of Mooney Falls. This section of trail is treacherous. The path leads hikers down wet cliffs under the mist of Mooney Falls. People are significantly injured on this stretch of trail each year, so we wanted to take our time. The first part descends through a rocky cave. It's dark, but relatively easy to navigate. The cave opens up to a chain guardrail, with an epic view of Mooney, before descending its most precarious section. The final descent requires focus. Mooney's wet cliffs can be slippery. Chains are nearby to help, but in our case some of the chains weren't anchored properly, which made it all the more difficult. Still, we push towards the bottom, and safely reach the base of Mooney Falls. Mooney Falls towers over the canyon, and it stands just under 200 feet tall. The waterfall was named after a rancher and gold prospector named Daniel Mooney. Some accounts say Mooney fell during a descent into the canyon. Other accounts say he fell on his way out of the canyon. Either way, Mr. Mooney fell to his death, and the waterfall was named Mooney Falls, which could be respectful or rude depending on your perspective. From Mooney, we continued down the trail towards Beaver Falls. 
This is Havasupai's most beautiful section of trail. The trail follows Havasu Creek into the Havasu Valley. The valley is lush with vegetation, and the canyon's vibrant red walls provide a beautiful backdrop. You might even see a few bighorn sheep grazing along the way. Although the trail does have a few obstacles, there are several water crossings, some deeper than others depending on the time of year. Then, as we neared Beaver Falls, we came to a few scrambles and ladders. One ladder seemed noticeably out of place, and it was anchored with a half-torn ratchet strap. It was secure enough, but hikers should always take responsibility for their own safety, so keep an eye on things while hiking this trail. Finally, after a few more ladders and a couple scrambles to the bottom, we reached Beaver Falls. This area boasts the best swimming hole in Havasupai, but it's also gorgeous, and it's a great place to relax. The next morning we packed up early and hiked back to Wallapai Hilltop. Now we had seen both sides of Havasupai. We had seen its power and its beauty. At this point we thought our Arizona adventure was complete, but the state had one more gift to bear before we left. Our last foray on this Arizona adventure took us on a sunrise drive into the desert and Vermilion Cliffs National Monument. It turns out that persistence can pay off. When we came back to the area, I entered the lottery for the wave. This time we won the lottery on our third try, and we had acquired Arizona's toughest permit. We hiked two and a half miles into the desert. We explored arches and dunes along the way. Then we took in the beauty of Arizona's most coveted trail. And much like the rest of the state, its beauty was humbling. It's a precious thing to be constantly humbled by the natural landscapes that surround you. Arizona's canyons and monuments made us feel tiny. Its jagged, icy peaks help to soften our egos. And its beauty left us speechless again and again. Arizona humbled us in all the right ways, but it was time to move north. We were headed to southern Utah and Zion National Park. We ventured to the top of Angel's Landing we hiked into the subway, and we traversed the Virgin River while we worked our way up the Narrows. Southern Utah was incredible. 